Hey folks, I'm here in Arizona with Jim Heffelfinger. Uh, Jim is the wildlife science coordinator. Coordinator. Yep. Did I get that right? You did. All right. Yep. Well, he's always this big fountain of information, more information than we can than we can fit on a video. And he has these <laughs> antlers, and he was telling all these things about antlers that you don't learn in high school, or I didn't learn in high school. I didn't learn anywhere, so I said, we need to do a video on that. I didn't learn most of this in college, my wildlife degree. Yeah. <laughs> and you, but, you've got advanced degrees in wildlife, so I don't feel when you find about. something that's interesting, like antlers, you can't help but pursue it and read a lot about it. And I've read a bunch about Mule it. Mule deer. Right, and there's a good example of a white-tailed deer, a pretty good cow's white-tailed deer, from not far from here, actually. A number of years ago, it was a pickup head, and a nice, nice mule deer. That was from the central part of uh, Arizona. Antlers are actually bones that grow outside of the skin. They grow initially in the skin, the velvet skin, and then this, the velvet skin dries and they shed it off. But they're actual bones that are outside of the body. And it's the only appendage in the mammal, the whole group of mammals, that's regenerate. Drops off, grows another one. So in like salamanders, some salamanders can lose a limb and they'll regenerate their limb. And lizards lose a tail, they regenerate their tail. It doesn't happen in mammals except for one thing, and that's antlers. And that, that has researchers actually using the antler cycle as a model for me in medical research to see if someday we can, we can find a way to tap into the secrets of how this appendage gets regenerated and use that to regenerate limbs. I mean, people, amputees lose limbs. There may be a time in the future where we're able to unlock the secrets of what goes on in, in the antler regeneration and see if we can regenerate other bones, like arm bones and leg bones. That's pretty amazing. Antlers grow so fast. Elk antlers grow uh, as much as a half inch a day. And now that's to the point where you can almost watch them grow, a half inch a day. So you've got bone growing half inch a day, skin on the outside growing, nerves growing a half an inch a day to keep up with that. And that's the fastest growing animal, that's the fastest growing tissue in the whole animal kingdom, is elk antlers in the peak of their growth, their growth rate. Wow. That kind of uh, almost uncontrolled growth has been used by some cancer researchers to look at cells that just grow fast uncontrollably and then they stop. The antler at some point, the antler growth stops. So how do we stop that uncontrolled growth of, of cells? And so some cancer researchers are kind of experimenting with that and, and looking at antler growth as a model to, to try to find a cure for cancer too. You, you may not have known it, but when you're out there in the woods picking up shed antlers or, or deadheads like that, there's a story of these, but there's also a bigger world going on out there that is looking at the magic of, of nature mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. trying to use it for applications for humans. Yep, beneficial applications, that's right. Huh. And that, that velvet that grows from the, the bases, these are called pedicles at the base, and when those start growing, that velvet is actually a skin with a lot of fur on there, but highly vascularized, a lot of blood vessels, highly innervated, so there's a lot of nerves in there. It's sensitive and so they protect those while they're growing and, and don't damage those antlers. And, and also those nerves uh, are, are, have a lot to do with the shape. So we've got a white tail shape that we're familiar with. Mm -hmm. And we've got a mule deer shape, which is called dichotomous branching, where they branch and then each branch branches again. So you've got these different species and they're all from scratch every year growing their own species specific shape. And it's the nerves that help guide that, help, uh, help shape those antlers. And if you have a problem with the nerves that are supplying the antlers here, you'll see all kinds of funky shapes. That's where you see sometimes these real freakish racks. Sometimes it's the damaging of the nerves and then the antlers just can't grow correctly. So that's why in the summertime, you'll see bachelor groups of bucks out in the open more than mm -hmm. in the brush because yep. of the sensitivity of those nerves? It, it, they'll certainly seek cover, but they're, they're really sensitive. It's like, it's like if uh, a, a big Texan that wears a big cowboy hat getting in and out of the pickup truck, he knows exactly where the rim of that cowboy hat is. <laughs> Never hits the cowboy hat in and out of the pickup truck. It's the same thing with the bucks as these grow. They do, they do hit a little bit on branches and things, so they learn where those antlers are. And when mm. they get later and they shed their velvet and they've got hard antlers and they're fighting with other bucks, they know pretty well where each tine is. They know the shape of their antlers, even though they can't see them very well up on top of their head, really? because they, they can remember bumping them and, and they learn that. So this would apply to moose, deer, elk, caribou. Yeah. What determines the size and the mass or whatever of, of mm -hmm. antlers? 
So we need age. We know that yearling's not gonna be a big Boone and Crockett buck. So we need age. You've gotta get um, into the five to seven year range for whitetail and mule deer. That's when they peak in their antler growth. Sometimes they still get bigger after that, but sometimes they start declining. And when they get past that peak, a lot of times they keep getting mass, but they get shorter times, sometimes fewer times. And so you need age to get them into that bracket. You also need good nutrition. You can have um, animals on, in poor years, and a lot of people that spend a lot of time out in the field know poor years, you've got smaller antlers, you can have a good antler year, and that really is a true thing. A good nutrition year, you can put on a lot more antler growth. So you've got age, and you've got nutrition, and then the last one is genetics. And the genetics is really the last thing that most people should be thinking about, but it's normally the first thing that people do think about. Like this area doesn't have good genetics. This area has got bad genetics or it has good genetics. In reality, it's, it's almost always an age structure thing. How many older bucks do you have? And a nutrition thing. How much nutrition are they, are they getting? But genetic, there's no doubt genetics goes into antler development because you can get animals in a pen the same age feed them the same exact nutrition. So you've got same age, same nutrition, and you'll have a bell-shaped curve on their antler scores. You'll have some smaller ones, you have most of them kind of in the middle, and then you'll have some really exceptional ones over there. So you need, it's like a tripod, you need all of those, age, nutrition, and genetics. So somebody's probably asking, why do they even have antlers? What purpose do antlers serve? Mm -hmm. Other than to make them Desirable. There you go. <laughs> By us. Yeah. Yes. There's a lot of different theories, but really the two theories that make a lot of sense and most scientists um, are, are really agree with. And, and one is obviously they're ball pointed. Mm -hmm. They have to be weapons. I mean, obviously one of the reasons is to fight other males um, for access to females. And so if antlers really weren't weapons, which some people have said, you know, that's a lesser reason. If they really weren't weapons, they wouldn't all be pointed. So it's kind of an obvious thing that they serve as weapons. But there's another thing that um, is really strongly supported by the science, and that is as a, as a visual cue for the fitness of the animal. So these bucks that have good genetics, they're old enough, and they're able to get enough good nutrition, they make good fathers for the next generation of fawns, and females can look at a male and can assess how good they are at getting nutrition, how, how old they are, and how good genetics they have. And, and there's actually selection where females will, will gravitate more to, to bucks with larger antlers. So they actually act as display, they call those display organs, because they're, it's a visual way to display how macho you are and how fit you are and how good your genetics are. So since he doesn't have a stock portfolio to show off, he... <laughs> or a fancy race car. Yeah, he, he doesn't have a Corvette, got he's got antlers. That's right. And I've often wondered, well, if you got a big set of antlers, even if you're not Just, really tough, Mm -hmm. You probably scare off most people or right. most other of your competitors. Mm -hmm. Someone in Mississippi in, in captivity did a study where they sawed off the antlers at the base and then they put a little bracket here. And then on the same deer, they put small antlers and big antlers. And they mm -hmm. looked and see how the does reacted to the same deer smelling the same way with the same kind of a natural aggression with big antlers and smaller antlers and the does preferred the bigger antlers. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good way to test that. <laughs> oh. Well, as always, Jim, thanks so much for your time and all your little bits of information that I think people want to know. I enjoy it. Yep. I mean, there's it's a interesting reason to that, talk about this. reason that most people pick these up when they see them laying on the ground or if we're lucky enough to, to put a tag on an animal, yeah, we get all the wonderful meat and everything else, but these are kind of a reminder and, and something that I think historically has always been there in the hunting right. world. I, you I guarantee the, you cavemen were talking about giant uh, Irish elk versus the smaller Irish elk. Yeah. You know they were talking about that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you bet. Thanks for watching, folks. <laughs>